very well placed to address these issues. He's a very interesting career, Patrick, if I may say so. <laughs> Started with the BBC, then went on to Yahoo, where he was um, head of global business and human rights. Um, and then he was head of public policy in the UK and Ireland, and is now, as you know, head of um, public policy in Europe and Canada for Airbnb. But in doing that, I think he has a great understanding and experience of both the commercial, the political, and the strategic drivers around what made changes in both technology, you know, the, uh, the uh, content, as well as e-commerce. So that, that's quite a range. And he has a great, um, I'd say, capacity, but interesting as well, Patrick, of dealing with governments regulators and all these nice people who create the framework for working um, within. And I think really recently, and I'm sure you'll talk about it, um, Patrick, yeah. creating the, um, the, tool, the tool chest, isn't it? Yes, it always sounds Policy a little tool ana chest. anatomical. Yeah. But yes, it but is. But it, it is very interesting because it covers um, a lot of areas um, like dealing with tax, neighbours, privacy and a whole array of other issues that can create a framework for regulation without being totally prescriptive. So we look forward to your presentation and thank you very much for coming here today. The first thing to say is that modern travel is rubbish. Who has been to see the Mona Lisa? It yes. is probably the most disappointing experience that you could possibly have. And Airbnb exists to try and solve that problem. But that wasn't actually the problem that Airbnb was originally um, uh, designed to solve. Who's used Airbnb either as a, uh, as a guest? Or do we have any Airbnb hosts in the room? Interesting. So, um, Not yet, Patrick. <laughs> Airbnb is founded on the idea of real homes, real experiences, real people. We are adding real people back into the tourism industry, back into the travel sector. Uh, when you ask people why they travel, quite often they talk about wanting to connect with real people and yet they spend most of their time connecting with dead things, old things in museums. They actually very rarely get to connect with the people who uh, are the reason that they say they're going somewhere. So that is why peer-to-peer -peer travel, collaborative travel is um, such a different and new phenomenon. Um, as I say, it wasn't originally uh, designed to solve that problem. This is the original Airbnb. It's on number 19 Rouse Street in San Francisco. This was the apartment uh, that was rented by two of our three founders. Um, they had just graduated from uh, design college and they moved to San Francisco thinking they were going to establish the next big thing. Uh, the next big thing took a little bit longer than they thought to find uh, and they ran out of money. Uh, this was in 2008. The financial crisis was biting. Uh, they realised that the only way they were going to pay the rent that month was by finding some source of income. And the only thing they had was this apartment. They knew that there was a big design fair coming to San Francisco. For anybody that's been to San Francisco, you know that hotel capacity is not very large and that the city was pretty much going to be full. So they decided they were going to pump up some airbeds get some stuff in the fridge for breakfast, and set up the first air bed and breakfast. Here they are. So this is Joe, this is Brian, and this is their friend Nate, who joined the company later. They uh, set up air bed and breakfast. They put uh, 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 together a really quick website, and uh, they got some local media, local press attention about this, because it was just a crazy idea. Um, and within a few hours, they had their first three guests. Kat, Amol, and Michael came and stayed in Bow Street for the design festival. And the founders realised at that point that they probably had stumbled on the next big thing after all. Um, we've come a long way since then. There are now three million places to stay on Airbnb in about 65,000 places worldwide in 191 countries. Um, at our peak night this last year on New Year's Eve, there were two million people staying in an Airbnb somewhere in the world, which gives you a sense of the scale of this activity now. Um, and growth in terms of numbers uh, of guests has been truly spectacular. We've now seen 150 million guest arrivals 
with us doubling pretty much every year so far. Um, so we're genuinely seeing some quite staggering uh, growth rates. Uh, we're now moving into other areas too. So we're not just about where you stay, we're also about what you do. Uh, so in 12 cities, we've launched um, a series of experiences that, again, residents of those cities are providing to guests. The samurai sword artist in Tokyo, a truffle hunter in Florence, and in fact, this guy used to be Nelson Mandela's prison guard, and he is doing an exclusive tour, um, first thing in the morning, out to Robben Island, where he will tell you the story of what it was like to look after Nelson Mandela for um, however many years he did. Um, so we're getting into the, to new areas of travel, and again, putting people at the heart of the experience that um, uh, travellers have. So who's doing this? Um, our community is actually ordinary Europeans. So this is some data that we publish on uh, our um, uh, website about typical host activity. So in, for example, Amsterdam, a typical host is hosting for just 28 nights a year. In Lisbon, it's 76 nights a year. In Paris, it's 26 nights. People are earning some meaningful, but nonetheless non-commercial amounts of income. And this is a new thing. The idea that real people are participating in economic activity at quite a low level is something that regulators have to start getting to grips with in a way that they never have done before. So, the regulatory questions. We're talking about co-regulation, self-regulation, statutory regulation, lots of regulatory questions about us and about the collaborative economy more broadly. So let's start by talking about trust, which is pretty much the one significant factor in driving the uptake of peer-to-peer -peer services like ours. The idea of inviting a complete stranger into your home was, until a few years ago, somewhat alien. The idea that you could trust somebody with your most valuable asset, sometimes when you're still in it, and oftentimes when you're not in it, was pretty alien to people. But somehow, we and many of the other um, companies in this space have found a way of getting strangers to trust one another in a way that perhaps we haven't done for many, many years. Um, the high priestess of the uh, sharing economy, the collaborative economy, we'll talk about terminology in a minute, is a woman by the name of Rachel Boxman, who's done lots of work on uh, collaborative economy models and what drives them. And she talks about this thing called the trust stack. Just that firstly, you need to trust the idea. As a consumer, you need to trust the idea that staying in somebody else's home is going to be a good idea. Then you need to trust the service provider that you use. You need to trust Airbnb to actually be your home sharing option of choice. And then you need to trust the other person who's actually providing the service to you. And that is what ultimately drives this growth of trust in a big community of people. We look at it slightly differently. So, going from the top down, our baseline is that we want to make sure that we're compliant. We as a platform are fully compliant with all of the current laws and regulations. I see people from Google in this room. We're all obeying the same basic rules. Data protection, protection of payments, the consumer rights laws that exist across Europe, fraud and fraud prevention. Um, but then on top of that, we have many things that we do that add an additional layer of trust. We provide 24-7 customer service in just about any language you care to mention um, uh, across multiple time zones. Um, we have host protection insurance and um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, other forms of guarantee that mean that you can trust us as a platform. And we use secure communication so that uh, we are keeping track of the transactions and making sure that people are not being dragged off the platform to engage in potentially fraudulent activity. And then there's a load of stuff we do on the innovative side about verifying people's IDs, peer-to-peer -peer review systems, which I'll talk about in a second, and many of the things that we do in terms of civic engagement, tax compliance, lots of the fun and interesting stuff that I think is fun and interesting. Um, so we think about trust in multiple levels as well. And that really represents many of the self-regulatory things that we do uh, already, um, and which we think need to be part of the conversation about regulating the collaborative economy more broadly. So let's talk about peer reviews for a second. If you've used Airbnb, this would be very familiar to you. 
we have a situation where hosts review guests after every stay and guests review hosts after every stay. And we make sure that hosts and guests don't see each other's reviews until they've provided one. So you can be brutally honest or not, depending on your view. Um, this is an incredibly powerful way of driving good behaviour from both sides of the community. If you get bad reviews, you are not going to be chosen as a host and you're not going to be allowed access to people's homes as a guest. So it really incentivizes you to behave yourself. I must have about, well, I don't have 212 reviews. I think I've probably got about 70 to 80 reviews now. I am still today very conscious of leaving people's apartments much cleaner than I leave my own. <laughs> uh, I broke a wine glass one time and I had sleepless nights about it for several days. Um, uh, so this kind of system really drives good behaviour. I talked about insurance. We had a well-publicised nightmare a couple of years into the company where somebody got home after renting their space out to find that her apartment had been completely trashed. And we totally dropped the ball on that. And uh, since then, we've offered uh, no questions asked, automatic protection up to a million dollars for anybody renting their place out on Airbnb. Completely supplementary to anything that you've got with your homeowner's insurance or your content insurance. It's just there. And it means that if anything happens, a host chucks your TV out, of, sorry, I guess chucks your TV out of the window. Um, we will obviously try to get you to resolve that with your, uh, with your guest through various systems we have. But if that doesn't work, we're there to uh, step in. And more recently, we've started protecting hosts again automatically on liability issues. So a guest trips and falls in your shower um, or uh, causes a flood that floods the flat downstairs. Again, there's an additional million dollars um, of insurance to cover you. We had to do a lot of work with the Lloyds of London and with the insurance brokers to start talking about risk in this environment. Um, we do a lot on safety. One of the things, the questions we get a lot is about how we ensure that places are safe. Well, we do a lot of work in terms of host education uh, and making sure that they uh, understand what their obligations are. We provide free smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors to hosts. And we also partner with organisations that help prepare hosts uh, for safety and for um, uh, natural disasters. This happens to be the London Fire Brigade. They've worked with us to provide some specific safety tips and point people to the relevant regulations. We've done similar things with the Red Cross in terms of emergency response, first aid, all kinds of things that hosts will find useful. And then, as an industry, we are working on self-regulatory um, uh, schemes uh, to provide consumers with um, uh, evidence that we are meeting some basic standards as platforms. So Sharing Economy UK is the UK's Sharing Economy Trade Association, and we've been working with a series of experts with Oxford University and with um, PricewaterhouseCoopers to establish the world's first sharing economy trust seal, which a series of sharing economy platforms in the UK will start displaying to show that they are providing basic standards to consumers uh, around areas that we know consumers care about most. So there's lots of self-regulation stuff going on, but there is also lots of local and European regulation. Mm. Just over lunch, we were talking about how complex this picture is. This gives you an example. This is a link, it's just a screen grab from our website, of all of the various links there are to the specific rules that apply in different countries. And within that, you will find different rules in different places. So if you click on responsible hosting in the United Kingdom, you will find that there are different rules for London than for the rest of the country. In Spain, each of the autonomous regions of Spain has a different set of rules that hosts need to comply with. In the United States, you're going to be talking about many, many hundreds of different local rules. Mm -hmm. And the local rules are incredibly specific. This is just a snapshot of some of the stuff that we have to communicate to hosts in France about change of use requirements <coughs> in planning law, about taxes, about um, uh, you know, safety requirements, just about anything you need to know, we will provide you with. But it is incredibly granular. And so many of the issues that our hosts face um, are local, some are regional, 
Some are national, and they often have interrelationships between all, all, all three. And it's our job, my job, to go in and try and simplify some of that stuff on behalf of hosts. And I think what's unique about us versus many of the other tech-driven companies is that most of the regulations and laws that we're talking about are nothing to do with us. They're not laws and regulations that we have to apply and adhere to. They're the laws and regulations that our hosts need to apply to. And as you've seen earlier, they're just ordinary Europeans most of the time. They've never had to interact with any of these regulators. So it becomes harder and harder for them to understand what they're supposed to do. The EU uh, has done a lot of work on this because one of the obvious questions I get a lot is, well, can't the EU just wave a magic wand and introduce rules that apply to everybody simultaneously? And I think there are two issues with that. The first is that, obviously, the EU is only 28 member states, soon to be 27, um, and therefore doesn't necessarily help us in a load of countries that are not part of the EU framework. But also, uh, we are talking about issues over which the EU has zero competence. It has no ability to wade in on Dublin's planning law or on French safety regulations. Um, and equally, finding a set of rules that would apply equally to us as it would to Uber or eBay is pretty much impossible. We're completely different business models. We're doing different things. So what they've done instead is look at a series of... They, they reached a realisation, which is the correct realisation, that actually rules exist across all of these sectors already. There are rules for tourist accommodation. There are rules for taxis. There are rules for, for second-hand goods. Um, the challenge is applying those rules to some of these new platforms that are involving non-professionals um, in areas that they were never involved with before. So they've started and laid down a challenge to the member states through uh, this communication that they issued um, last year uh, on how to ensure that uh, licensing and registration systems are proportionate and are um, appropriate for individuals who are engaged in transient or, or sometimes um, uh, very small, low-level activity. Um, how to apply the platform liability rules that drive e-commerce and drive the, in the internet industry. How to apply those liability rules to activity like ours. How to ensure that consumer protection laws are adapted to take account of peer-to-peer -peer transactions and not just business-to-consumer activity. The thorny question that affects some platforms but not others about employment relations. What is an Uber driver? Are they an employee? Are they self-employed? What are they now? And also taxation and simplifying taxation, but also involving platforms like ours in the um, collection, calculation and education about, about tax. So the communication has been issued. Um, uh, the challenge has gone out to member states to examine the rules and regulations that apply in their backyard. That process is going on in a number of places. There are sharing economy reviews going on in Denmark. Norway, in Sweden, we've had one in the UK. Um, we're encouraging more and more European governments to really look at these issues and start uh, looking at regulations and adapting them to this new world. Which brings us to the policy toolkit. So one of the things that we've decided to do um, to try and simplify things for governments, many of whom don't really know how to even begin tackling some of these issues, is to lay out some of the solutions that we we've negotiated in other places. It's very rare for us to see a completely new issue raised by a government these days. We, I wouldn't say we've seen them all, but in my three years, I think we've got a good sense of what governments care about. So we have uh, laid out uh, a series of principles in the, in the toolkit that will govern the way that we negotiate with governments. We want to be accountable, and we want our host to be accountable. And we will collaborate on practical, smart, and crucially enforceable rules on home sharing. Some of the rules that currently exist are completely unenforceable. If I tell you that if you are a host in Brussels, uh, the current Brussels rules um, require you to have a certain number of coat hangers in the wardrobe, <laughs> and uh, limits the uh, voltage and wattage of the light bulbs you have throughout your home. Um, that doesn't seem particularly sensible, proportional, practical or enforceable to me. Um, equally on tax, we are looking to get more engaged on issues to do with tourist taxes in particular, hotel occupancy taxes, the kinds of things that apply to other forms of accommodation and how we step in to simplify that, but also crucially on income taxes. 
uh, where we're getting more and more questions from governments about how we ensure that um, people are understanding what's due and how to pay it. We want to ensure that hosts and guests are respectful of neighbourhoods where they share their space. Clearly we have um, lots of questions about parties and about nuisance and about noise. And we want to try and find new ways, again, of engaging hosts and guests in good behaviour. And also how we provide data to policymakers to enable smart decision making without, and that should say, violating the privacy rights of our users. Um, we have a balance to strike here between providing governments with information that allows them to understand what's going on in their backyards without necessarily providing oodles of personal data on people who are doing absolutely nothing wrong just because governments want access to that information. And we have a series of balances to strike there about our obligations to protect people's personal data and the desire of the London Borough of Camden to know how many hosts there are in their neighbourhood. So, how are we doing this? On accountability, um, San Francisco, brilliant example of how not to do it. This is an infographic that explains the process that you need to go through in order to get licensed as an Airbnb house in San Francisco. It is impossible, nobody does it, uh, and it just causes this churn of anxiety. The city doesn't see enough registrations coming through, our hosts cannot navigate this process, uh, they get kicked out of it too often, if they screw up at any point in it they need to go back to the beginning, they need to queue up at multiple government agencies holding multiple documents in order to make that work. An example of how not to do it. London, on the other hand, introduced rules in uh, 2015 that allow you, as a host in the City of London, to host for 90 nights a year without the need for any permission, any form of licensing, any permits, anything like that. Um, and we have now stepped in to actually help enforce that limit. So if you're an in entire host, uh, uh, host in London, so you're using your entire home, not just a spare room in it, um, you will find yourself unable to host after 90 nights of hosting a year, unless you can prove that you have permission to do so. Um, and that's an example of how we've stepped in to help the councils and say, well, look, yes, you could set up a system like San Francisco, but we could actually just help you with it. So that's the kind of thing that we're doing on accountability. On tax, we reached one of our first agreements in Europe, uh, in Amsterdam, where we are collecting on behalf of our hosts and on behalf of the city of Amsterdam, their 5% tourist tax. On every stay, it's just automatically there. We collect it. We stick it in a pot, and periodically we give the city of Amsterdam a load of money, which they're very pleased about. We've rolled that out now across much of France. We're now in 19 cities in France where we collect and remit tourist tax, um, and we collect about 7.2 million euros of tax in 2016. And in fact, that, that will be more than double this year because of the number of new cities that we're now going to be collecting in. Now, not everywhere has a tourist tax. Dublin doesn't have a tourist tax, for example. Um, but where we can step in and help, we will do. More frequently, we're asked about income taxes. So here in Ireland, this isn't an issue. We as an Irish company are required to pass the Irish government details of every Irish host and their earnings in the course of the year, uh, where we communicated to hosts that this was going to happen. And of course, some people were like, yeah, fine, bank rights, I should be paying my tax on this. Others genuinely didn't really understand that why this was taxable and they thought, rather like you did Joyce, this rent a room thing would apply to them. Hmm. So we've had to do a lot of work with the Irish Revenue on this, but also recognise that lots of people who have never been part of the tax system, have never filled in a tax return in their life, and now being required to fill in a tax return for often very small amounts of income. So again, we've been partnering with people like taxback.com to allow and help hosts <laughs> to complete their tax returns and also claim the various allowances that they are allowed. In Denmark, we've done some work with the Danish government on clear information for hosts. We also, for everybody in Europe, we allow you to check your host earnings, download a file that you can use to fill in your tax return. And a series of emails are going out in Europe right now uh, around tax season in each country to remind people about their income taxes. And there's more we can do here, for sure. Good neighbours. Uh, we have a tool that allows you to uh, report to us an issue that you might have with a neighbour who you think might be an Airbnb host. 
that goes into our customer care flow. We will take action where people are uh, absolutely Airbnb hosts and there are Airbnb bookings going on and where bad behavior is going on. And we're gonna make that more prominent in more places. And that's available in multiple languages too. But also, and this was a really interesting one, we, um, we want to be good for communities more broadly. Uh, we were somewhat taken aback last year by a series of pieces of academic research in the US that highlighted that black guests were being accepted for bookings far less frequently than white guests. And we realised that we had a problem with discrimination on the platform. And it wasn't necessarily witting discrimination. Some of it will have been unconscious bias from hosts about which guests to accept. And we did a very, very intensive review of our policies and practices in relation to discrimination. And we have now forced all of our global user base to explicitly accept our new anti-discrimination policy and we will be doing a lot of stuff on the back end, as we say, within our data analysis to look for patterns of discrimination and to challenge them whenever we can. We never set this platform up thinking that people were going to be racially <coughs> discriminating, ethnically discriminating, um, but actually the process of thinking about how you do uh, this kind of program on an online platform was a really, really interesting project. The hotels will tell you, well, it's simple. You just apply the law. Nobody can discriminate. You need to, you know, crack down on it. When you're talking about individuals inviting strangers into their home, it's a very different kind of setup, and therefore we've needed to find a, a new way of tackling a problem that is societal, but that is happening on our platform. And then we have also been helping governments with uh, natural, di uh, natural disasters and, and other issues that strike, uh, where we can very quickly respond with information for hosts and guests about uh, emergency response, about where to go to for information, about what to do. We're very quick now to put alerts out to people who might be in Paris during a terrorist attack, or in Italy during an earthquake, about where to get information, what to do, and our community gets stuck in by providing free accommodation to people who are affected by disasters. And we've done formal uh, memoranda of understanding with a series of governments around the world where we will help uh, liaise with their disaster response teams to help provide accommodation and also help support our guest community who might be caught up in that. And then finally, transparency and privacy. Um, we publish a lot of data. I think one of the unfair accusations about some of these new companies is that we are not transparent and I think nothing could be further from the truth. Yes, we want to protect our users' privacy and their families' privacy and we have obligations and responsibilities in that area but we also want to be providing information that allows people to make smart decisions. So very frequently we publish information about our community uh, with statistics about who's hosting, where, who are they, who are these guests, but in aggregate form. So we recently published some specific data about Dublin. Um, there were 6,100 hosts who hosted in Dublin during the previous year. They earned an average of 4,900 euros. A typical host is hosting for about 50 days a year. 77% of guests were specifically focusing on areas that they wanted to stay in. And we really do see guests using Airbnb to un uncover neighbourhoods that they wouldn't ordinarily get. There's a great slide that I often include, which maps Airbnb listings against hotels. And you can see a huge spread of activity way outside the usual hotel districts. And because we know that Airbnb guests tend to stay longer than typical hotel guests, and they tend to spend more because they've typically saved some money on their accommodation. They spend loads of that locally, which is good for small businesses in that area. So they stay for 3.2 nights, and we've had about just over 400,000 inbound guests to Dublin uh, last year. Um, 221 million euros get spent by the guests, again, lots of that in the local area that they uh, stay in, and the hosts have earned 52 million euros all of which gets reported to the tax authorities and, and uh, taxes paid on that. And we publish reports like that on a very, very regular basis. And in fact, there is a dashboard you can go, in, go to on our website that allows you to pick about 30 cities, and we update that information on an annual basis. Um, 
But I think crucially what we also do is tell the stories of the people who use us. And this is, these are some testimonials from outside, um, well, from all across Ireland, about why hosts host. And we know that hosts frequently start hosting because they want some extra money. But they stay hosting because it actually adds something to their lives. They start meeting people. They start experiencing other cultures. They start generating a pride in their local neighbourhood that perhaps they never had before. The number of places I've stayed where a guest has left me a really nice set of recommendations about restaurants to go to, things to see, and it's never the usual suspects. Mm -hmm. It's never the obvious places. It's always neighbourhood gems. It's always things that you wouldn't ordinarily get. So we, we collect these stories on a very, very regular basis, and, and increasingly, hosts are coming together, both at our urging but also independently, to start lobbying for themselves in areas. We've established about 150 clubs of hosts around the world now, about 40 of them in, in Europe. Uh, we have a big host community club in Dublin, and we're soon mm -hmm. going to be launching one in Cork. We help bring them together, but then they're off to the races. They do all kinds of things. Yes, they do political things for themselves. They turn up to public meetings. They go and meet MPs. They do letter-writing campaigns. But they also talk to each other about how to be better hosts. So actually, organising them and getting them involved in stuff is very important. And the data only tells so much, I guess, is really what I'm saying.